Okay, folks, we're going to get started here in just a moment. It's time for another 13 News Now Weather School. We do these each and every weekday at 9.15 in the mornings, and we made it to Friday. I know it's been a weird week for a lot of folks, and right now we're just making sure the streams are all up and we're rolling, and we'll build a little bit of audience here. We'll get things going, and uh, we'll talk about weather instruments today. Really, really excited about this. It is going to be a fun one. And I think uh, the kids are going to have some fun stuff to do. Maybe mom or dad or grandma or grandpa. Somebody's going to have some time uh, maybe a little later on to, to work on some of these fun weather experiments with the kids we're going to be going through. So again, we're allowing a little bit of, uh, of audience to build here with our weather school. And then we're going to jump in. I'll let you know these are also available on face are on YouTube. So not only here with a Facebook live, but also on YouTube. All right, let's go ahead and reveal here and we'll see if the stream is up. I believe it is. We should be good to go. And as we get things started, I do want to welcome everybody to our weather school 13 news. Now we're located in Norfolk, Virginia, but these are weather lessons. I know some of the teachers have been sharing them with students around the globe, and that's awesome. We want to get as many folks engaged and uh, doing this with us as possible. We're thinking about you. We're all in this together as we deal with COVID-19, the coronavirus. We hear all about that. So many kids out of school right now. Let's talk some weather. And again, today's lesson is dealing with weather instruments. Now, there are uh, you know a lot of different ways that we read the weather. We take a look. We've got satellites and radar. We talked about yesterday, all this stuff. But there are five basic instruments that have been around for a long time that give us a good feel for what's going on with several different conditions. And we want to focus on those with this video. And we're going to talk about the thermometer, the rain gauge, the hygrometer. That's one that you guys might not know about. Anemometer. Some grade school kids are all on it. You know exactly what a what a uh, anemometer is. Some may be going, huh, I thought I heard of that, but I'm not exactly sure. And the barometer, probably some of you familiar with that one as well. But those are the five key things that we use. And we're going to talk about what each one of them does and how you can make one of these weather instruments at home. So this is what we're going to focus on right now. As we take a look, uh, what I wanted to start with is the thermometer. All right, so here's the thermometer thermometer and the thermometer measures temperatures. Now we know this a lot of times, you know, if you're feeling sick or whatever, your mom or dad may take a thermometer and, you know, have you hold it under your tongue. That's the way we used to do it. You had to hold the thermometer for a long time and we'd wait for the reading to come out. But uh, now they've, of course, got different ways that you can electronically do it and you get real instant feedback here. Thermometers are typically filled with liquids and as the temperature warms, the liquid expands and fills the tube. So the warmer it gets, the more that moisture, that liquid in the thermometer expands and it goes farther up the tube, showing the higher temperature, all right? That's basically how a thermometer works, at least the old liquid filled kind. Now check this out, Galileo created this pre-thermometer. Look at this, it was basically a pot with a little cork in the top and there was a tube here. And what happened, there was dyed water in the bottom of this and it would rise and fall in the tube. The liquid would rise and fall based on the temperature. So very similar, the same basic concept that led to the more modern thermometers, but that was something Galileo did a long, long time ago. All right, so think about that. Now here's how you can make a thermometer at home. You're going to need a few things and we'll get into this. You can see a marked index card. Okay, and we'll explain why. A little bit of tape, clear straw, some modeling clay or Play-Doh, and some food coloring. That with this clear bottle. This is what it's going to take to, to do this. So how do you do this? All right, well, here's what you do. All right, you take these things and you're going to mark them up. All right, you're going to put the clear straw into the bottle here and we'll break all this down as we take a little closer look. You want to put about, oh, maybe about 80% of the bottle. You fill that with some liquid. You put a little bit of food coloring in there so it gives it a little bit of color. All right, you take the clay or the Play-Doh and you put it in the top of the bottle and that holds the straw in place. So you put the straw through the, the Play-Doh or the clay down into the bottle with the water in it, with the food coloring, all right? And you put that straw so it goes about halfway to three quarters of the way down in the bottle. That sets it up, okay? As you take a look, remember that index card, you put the hash marks on it and as the temperature rises in the room, you'll see 
that the water inside that bottle will expand and it'll push it up the straw and it'll get a little bit higher as it gets warmer. And when it's colder, you'll see it drop down. And if you've got that bottle and you've, you've made your homemade thermometer there, you can actually maybe take a hair dryer. If you've got an electric hair dryer, you can kind of warm up that water a little bit and you should see it expand up a little bit. Or if you've got maybe something cold, a cold compress or something, you can put it around that bottle, lower the water temperatures and you should be able to see it come down. So really a cool thing there. Hopefully you guys will be able to do that uh, as well. All right, as we take a look here, we will move on from this again. It moves up and down based on the temperature. Really, really cool. All right, the next thing that we're doing here, this is a rain gauge, all right? Rain gauge, simple enough, right? We measure how much rain falls. So the thermometer measures temperature. The rain gauge measures the amount of rain that falls. Very important when we need to keep track of whether or not we're getting enough rain for our soils and our crops. You talk about water management back in the Western US, if they're getting enough rainfall, and if they don't, they have to gauge how much rain to release from reservoirs. It's, it's a lot that goes into tracking how much rain we have. Rain gauges use a funnel at the top to catch the rain and it's measured in inches on the rain gauge. Or if it's other parts of the world, some folks may measure it in centimeters, but here in the United States, we measure it, typically keep track of it in inches. Now, ancient Greeks were doing this for a long, long time, all right? Ancient Greeks and some folks back in ancient India as well, were the first ones to measure rain using basic collection containers. They were doing this all the way back to 400 BC. So again, just basic concept of trying to track how much rain is falling over an area. It has been around for a super long time. I'm checking my feed here because I haven't seen the live feed come up. I wanna make sure you guys are able to do this at home. If you guys have some questions, I think Rochelle and Peyton are gonna be in there as well. And uh, hopefully you guys have, and I'm seeing some comments coming in and hopefully we're good. So uh, you can give me a thumbs up if you guys are getting this and, and it's all making sense. All right, so a do-it-yourself rain gauge. You've got a two liter bottle there, maybe a little bit of masking tape, say six inches or so, and a ruler to help things out here. As we take a look here, this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna have an adult. We don't want the kids messing around trying to cut off the top of a two liter bottle, but get an adult to take the top off of a bottle, set it aside, all right? You're going to take that ruler and you're gonna take your tape right alongside and you're gonna create the basic same hash marks over one inch, two inch, three, four, five. You move that over so that your tape shows the inches along the same as the ruler there, all right? So once you have that, you're gonna take your bottle, put a little bit of water in the bottom to kind of keep it stable, keep it from getting knocked over. You know, your rain gauge is gonna be outside. So, you know, sometimes with the rain, if you don't have anything weighting the bottom of that, the wind will knock it over and all of a sudden your rain gauge is worthless. So you put a little bit of weight in the bottom of that, you can use an inch of water or so. All right, you line up the tape with the top of the water before it starts raining, that's your zero. Even though there's water in it, you want that level before you start measuring rain to be at zero, all right? And then you flip that part that was cut off and you put it in the top, all right? And you get it set so that when it starts to rain, that top part collects the water. It'll funnel down into the bottle and you'll see the amount of water going up in the bottle. So you get a couple inches of rain, you'll see it come up a couple inches on your tape. It's that simple. You do wanna make sure that that, that uh, top part flipped over doesn't push down into it. You just put it right at the top there and maybe put a little bit of tape or something around it to hold it. But that's gonna do it for you. That's a basic rain gauge and it's a way you can track how much moisture falls during a given event. Now, you gotta remember to empty it out and get it reset before each rainfall. Otherwise, if you forget about it, you know, it gets kind of nasty and gunky in there and it's a, it's a mess for you. But anyway, that's one way that you can measure that and you wanna reset it so you get an accurate reading each time there's a rain event. All right, now we're gonna talk about the hygrometer, okay? And the hygrometer is uh, another interesting thing. Some of you may or may not be familiar with it. Anybody got any guesses on what a hygrometer measures? 
And I'll tell you right now, I'm kind of flying a little blind as far as our Facebook Live goes. I'm not seeing the stream coming in, so I'm going to trust some of you are making some pretty good guesses on that, okay? What a hygrometer measures is the amount of humidity or water vapor in the air, all right? And we have the hygrometers, and there's kind of interesting, there's a lot of different ways that we can measure the humidity now. There's a lot of modern hygrometers that do it differently. But one of the ways that has been used for a while, I think this is really cool, uh, they can actually use hair, either human hair or animal hair, because hair changes length based on the humidity. Hello, frizz factor. Rochelle was helping. Rochelle Peart was putting this together, and this is a thing. We've talked about it. We've joked around about my wife, and she sits there, you know, in the humidity, or there's any rain out there. She's like, oh, my hair, and I'm thinking, what's going on? Well, it's getting a little longer, a little frizzier. It happens because the hair absorbs the humidity, or the water vapor in the air gets a little longer. It tends to get a little bit crazier, so it's a thing, all right? You get the frizz factor with higher humidity. So how do you make a hygrometer? Well, let's Let's take a look and again a lot of different ways that uh, you can do this but this is a fun way that you do this at home all right you have a piece of cardboard you have a longer strand of hair a couple pieces of tape some construction paper and maybe a thumbtack or a push pin okay you can do this now as we take a look this is going to be one of those that's maybe a little more challenging to do but but we'll see how you guys do with this you set your cardboard up okay you mark at the bottom humid and dry you've got your pieces standing by there you're going to put these onto this cardboard okay so the top you've got some tape here and you tape one end of that strand of hair up high and if you've got long hair, it's got to be longer than mine. I'm sorry if you don't have long hair available. But if you do have long hair available, you strike, you, you tape one end up a little bit higher, one a little bit lower, and you tape that to that car or that piece of paper, that arrow there. All right. You push pin the arrow to the cardboard. All right. And you put that tape, the hair to the back of that arrow and you're pretty much set up. Now what's gonna happen? All right, you take a look and you go, okay, well, when it's muggy, remember, the hair absorbs the water vapor and the moisture and it gets a little longer. So that arrow, if you've got what we call, you know, a little bit of tension on that, the arrow will actually get a little bit down as that hair gets just a little bit longer. So it pivots down a little bit and it's gonna show more humidity. You have hair tension, gets a little longer, the arrow tilts down, and as it's drier, just the opposite occurs. When it's drier, that hair shrinks a little bit, so it's gonna pull that arrow up just a little bit, making it show the drier conditions. Kind of fun, did you know you could do that with your hair? All right, something to maybe try if you get that chance later on. I think that's a fun little experiment. All right, an anemometer. An anemometer is used to measure the wind. And that's a tough word to say, especially for some of the younger kids. When I go out and do the school talks, I say, all right, what measures wind? Anemometer, everybody say anemometer, and you hear all kinds of things. Anemometer, anemometer, all right? That measures the wind speed, and that thing that we often associate with winds that shows direction, that's called a wind vane. Okay, and a wind vane will show the direction that the wind's blowing. An anemometer actually shows the speed of the wind. So that's what's important here. Anemometer measures wind speed. Now, anemometers typically use little cups, like these little cups attached to these arms here. And when the wind's stronger, the cups catch the wind and they spin a little bit faster. And again, I mentioned the wind vane helping show the direction. So how do you do one of these at home? Well, you can do it if you have these basic things. You have a spool, a pencil, a couple of cardboard strips, again, a needle or a pin, and some of those cupcake liners and thumbtacks. Now again, watching this video, we're running through a lot of this really quick, but the cool thing about these videos is you can go back and say, all right, let's back up, take a look here and see what I need. Okay, so you got all this stuff right. Now you're ready to try to make your own anemometer. Let's take a look here. All right, so you put the uh, pencil in the spool, and that's gonna act as the base, all right? You have the uh, cardboard strips. You have to notch them so that you can seat them one inside of the other. You wanna get them so that they do kind of a cross like that, but you wanna create a little notch in them, so you'll set them in one right after the other, and then you have your 
little cupcake liners and you take your thumbtacks and you push each cupcake liner to a piece of that cardboard. So you've got four pieces there, four little cupcake liners and it sets them up. You put a needle through the center of that cross that you've made that has each one of these cups and into the pencil eraser. So that's going to act as your central point on that. So what happens is when you start to blow on those cupcake liners, they're going to spin around and the faster you blow, the more you'll see the cupcakes spinning around on the cardboard and the slower, again, it goes a little slower. Tough? Yeah, maybe, but it's something to try at home while we've got this time, right? Everybody's staying inside right now, social distancing, something to try. And if you've got great weather where you are and you don't want to try this right now, maybe it's something you try over the weekend or later on when it's raining and you can't get outside and get that exercise. Just a cool way to check out and make your own anemometer. All right. Last one we're going to talk about in terms of the weather instruments, the barometer. Okay, and a barometer, a barometer measures air pressure. Now, quite simply, when you think about air pressure, we're basically taking the weight of the atmosphere over a given point. Now, what do I mean? You think about our air and you can't typically see it. You'll see dust or you might see rocks or you might see water vapor droplets condensing, you know, where you see clouds and stuff in the air. But typically when you look around, air is invisible. You can't really see it. <sighs> you can feel it. Okay. And there's actually weight. There's like an ocean of air all around the world. Some areas we have waves, okay, where there's more atmosphere or more air over a point and in between those waves those crests we have dips or what we call troughs well where you have the tops of the waves just like we have waves on the ocean and out around the world okay we have this invisible ocean of air around you have the waves where there's more air over a spot there's more weight pushing down there the pressure is higher where you have the trough in between those waves, there you have lower pressure. So we measure over a given area, whether there's a lot of air pushing down or a lot of weight of the atmosphere, or whether there's less, we know whether there's high pressure or lower pressure over our spot. Now again, they've been doing the barometers for a while, all right? Some are used with mercury, but there are a lot that are made non-mercury. The barometers are more, uh, they're more common. They're called aneroid bar barometers. And they're, it's just basically a small cell, an aneroid cell, and it's uh, made of, of a, uh, an alloy, I think typically beryllium and copper. And what they do is that measures the pressure changes. And those are a little more common now. They're more common and they're safer. So folks, don't, you don't see as much of the mercury barometers anymore, but it is something uh, that's kind of cool to think about. Now, this is an experiment, something I actually did when I was way back in high school, all right, for one of my science projects. And I think some of the kids are doing this younger now, even in grade school, folks will play around and do some of the barometers. I know we've done this with my kids in school as well, but you can take a container. I've used a coffee can before. I've used different things, but it, for this particular thing, you could take uh, a glass from the kitchen. Okay, and you want to take that and you're going to need a balloon. Again, a spool will help you. Uh, a card, an index card marked, some tape there, a toothpick or a sewing needle, and a pencil and a straw. Okay, how does all this come together? We'll take a look right now. The first thing you want to do, you want to stretch that balloon out over the cup. Okay, you want to make sure that's tight on there, okay? So you've got the balloon stretched out over the cup. Okay, you glue the straw to the top of the balloon, you attach the toothpick or the sewing needle to the end of the straw, then you've got your pencil and your spool again set up to create your gauge. You mark your index card with an L for low pressure and an H for high pressure, all right, and that's your general setup. Now what happens? Well, we're going to measure, again, the weight of the atmosphere over a given point, so when there's more weight over the area, okay, and the atmosphere is really, really, you know, when you've got more over the given area, the pressure is higher, what happens is it pushes down. In this case, there's less weight. This is where there's that dip between the troughs, and in that case, the pressure will actually pull up a little bit, and you'll see with the balloon pulling up from the top of the glass, the needle goes down. Again, that's the low pressure between the two 
peaks of higher pressure. All right. When that pressure is higher, it pushes down more and it pushes that balloon down into the cup a little bit. So the straw tilts up and you see higher pressure. Pretty cool. I've seen this work. You may be doing it in your classrooms. If you haven't ever tried this, it's something fun and you can see it does work. It's really a fun experiment. It's pretty cool. All right, so a couple of trivia questions. We're going to see if you've been paying attention. If you know what's going on here, we'll see what kind of uh, response we get here. All right, we mentioned earlier that a pretty famous uh, scientist came up with this. Guy came up, said, all right, we can do this. This contraption came before which instrument? Do you recall, was it an anemometer, a hygrometer, a barometer, or a thermometer? Hmm, see what you guys think. Did you guess D, thermometer? That's what it was, all right, Galileo. Thermometer. All right, that's the early contraption. This one, okay, which one did we say was the earliest instrument, weather instrument that we know was used on record? What do you think? Was it a thermometer, a rain gauge, a barometer, or an anemometer? We talked about it. Said earlier, I said it wasn't, you know, like it is now, but they had something a long time ago that kind of gave them their first indications of what was going on. Do you remember us talking about the ancient Greeks back about 400 BC? They had the crude collection vessels and they would measure the rain based on that. All right, so there you go. Earliest weather instruments used on record 400 BC, the rain gauge. Hopefully uh, you guys knew that. Want to give a shout out to Rochelle Peart. She did an awesome job helping pull some of the graphics together for this Facebook Live. You can follow Rochelle at Rochelle TV, at Rochelle TV on Instagram as well, and Twitter it is underscore Rochelle TV. And I'll remind you, if you've got uh, some interest, you want to reach out to me through Facebook, my professional page, Craig Moeller, Instagram, Craig Moeller TV, and Twitter. 13 Craig Moeller. You can pass along suggestions for more of these in the future. They're a lot of fun and we're getting lots of great ideas, lots of great feedbacks. I'll tell you what, I'd love to see some pictures of some of the kids. Maybe if you get a working weather instrument that you've done at home, take a picture of that, send it in, and maybe we'll throw some up on the uh, news here at 13 News Now. It's a lot of fun. All right, to give you a heads up, next week with our weather schools, we're going to focus on severe weather, different types of severe weather, um, criteria for severe weather. We're going to have a bunch of them. I think a lot of fun. So if you love talking about storms and how they affect us and all those types of things. Be sure to join us all next week. Again, weekdays, 915 right here on Facebook. We'll be live. And again, you can find these on our 13 News Now YouTube page as well. You guys stay safe. All right. I want everybody to try to have a good weekend. Try to relax. Keep your social distance. OK. And if you can, try to sneak in a little bit of exercise. It's important that we help each other get through this. And again, we're all going to get through this together. And this country is going to come out stronger. All right. Hang in there, guys. Thanks so much for joining us for this lesson with our weather school. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time.